there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter. Today for Watercolor Wednesday, we're gonna do a quick and easy landscape of Mount Fuji. I also wanted to let you know, you get about a week to save 50% on my new watercolor landscape workshop class, if you're interested in that. Um, I will put a link in the video description and the coupon code, which is landscape 50 off, but I'll put the, um, I'll put the link in the in the in the uh, I'll put the code in the link so if you click on that you shouldn't have any problems otherwise you just add the coupon code on the checkout page so just uh, just want to put that out there if anybody was looking to get that class before the lunch month special was off I'm not sure if you can see that I'm gonna make it a little bit darker for you is that showing up Maybe I'll grab a little gray. I'm loving my color erase pencils. I've been sketching a lot with these for markers, if I'm using marker or watercolor lately, and I just really, really like them. You can lighten up any of your lines with an eraser before you start painting if you want to, which is really nice. Now I'm just gonna, um, you don't have to sketch this on, but I'm just gonna kind of put the, um, the snow, just indicate the snow here just so you kind of get an idea. And um, if you are uh, a little bit slower of a painting, having some of that down, it can help you when you um, when you paint. So you're not feeling like you have to, you know, you're not feeling like everything's going too fast and you can't um, kind of think and get everything done. Now I actually have the top of this a little bit wider than I want because I want it to be pushed back a little bit. So I am gonna thin it out a little bit. And I feel like I have that angle a little on the steep side, so. I brush my crumbs away. I'm just using some inexpensive cotton paper. I had some laying around that I wanted to use up. No particular brand, just wanted to kind of get rid of it. Um, and something like this where we're not going to be doing a lot of scrubbing will work out really well. So what I'm doing here, which you probably couldn't, couldn't totally see, is that um, I was using my my pencil to kind of grab the angle from the actual reference photo I'm using that I will link up. I want the end of this mountain to be about a third of the way up the paper, so we have the rule of thirds. We're dividing the paper up into thirds here. Okay, I really think that's about all I need to have down for this, uh, for this sketch. Hopefully this eraser doesn't mar the paper. I haven't used this paper in years, so I'm hoping it's still good. Sometimes you'll get like weird speckles on um, on paper after it's kind of past its prime. All right, I am going to wet the sky. This is a block of paper, which means it is, um, instead of being in a pad, it's actually glued on all four sides, and that's really handy um, and convenient because that way um, you don't have to tape it down. Of course, taping it down gives you a pretty white border on the edges, but um, this is certainly convenient. Plus, I mean, if you're going to frame it anyway, you, the pretty white border would be hidden behind the mat, you know, that you would use to frame it. So, I like I like to use blocks; they're very handy. So, what I'm doing now is tipping it to the light to see any spots I've missed. If I was going to wet the whole back back of the paper. The whole background, I would use probably a spray bottle and then spread it around. Now, since this is a cellulose paper, which is what a lot of beginners start off with, um, you might notice that it absorbs water not very evenly. So to combat this, and I actually do this with my, uh, with my cotton paper as well, I'll wet it, then I'll go over to my palette and I'll start mixing up the colors that I want. So I want a blue sky. Um, I want it, uh, I'm gonna go here, let's try this. I think this is a... Where's my little thing? I think that's a, might be a cerulean blue. Let's see. Oops, I got my huh, got this turned around. Um, it's actually a turquoise, turquoise PB16. That's weird. I've never seen that before. But that's what I'm going to use. Actually, no, that's cyan. That's cyan that I'm using here. PB15 colon three. That's what I'm using. I'm going to start with that, which is kind of a staining color, but I don't have a lot of clouds I want to lift out or anything, so it's going to be fine. And I don't want it quite that blue, so I'm going to add something else into it. I think I'm going to add a little bit of violet into it, or something that's got a purpley tone. Um, I think I will use a little bit of this kind of mauve color. They call it purple in the Lucas line. 
By the way, this video is brought to you by jerrysartorama.com. Uh, you can find these Mimic Faux Squirrel Brushes. They are absolutely um, animal free, but they are uh, they do perform like a squirrel brush. I really, really like it. Now, I'm gonna, that's going to be my sky color. I'm going to mix up a little bit more to make sure I don't run out. And then I'm going to clean my brush and I'm going to re-wet the background because I've noticed that some areas look a little shiny now and some look dull. So by doing that second wetting, even if it's on a cotton paper, it's going to give you a little bit more uniform. You want to make sure you don't have puddles. I really like these Lucas watercolors. I like to use them when I want um, a more delicate, subtle look. They're not um, crazy. They're really, I mean, look at this is a swatch. They're really bright, they're gorgeous colors, but they're not like in your face, like crazy colors, I guess. I don't know, it's hard to describe. Sometimes paints just seem to have a different feeling for you. Um, but they're very affordable for professional grade paints. They're made in Germany um, and they're sold, I think exclusively through Jerry's Artorama. They have a student line too that's really good. This is the professional line, but they do have a student line that's very uh, affordable and nice. Now I want to get this little bit of a patterning in the sky that almost looks like um, you've got kind of like a little bit of a streaky cloud thing happening. Oh, I usually I like to make sure I have enough. I didn't pre-spray my palette. I just realized that. Um, and I haven't used this in a couple of weeks and but the colors do re-wet pretty well but I didn't I forgot to pre-spray. Um, so I wanted to get kind of that a little bit of um, striation in the sky where you've got kind of those thready looking clouds. And I don't really want to lift, but since I know my paper is really wet, but evenly wet, not puddly, I can get that effect. So when you're using a color that you know stains, like the cyan, that's a really smart way to use it. And I know this is, since the background is pretty wet, I know that this is going to uh, dry a little bit lighter. So. I want to put my colors a little bit darker than what I want to end up with. So just kind of keep that in mind when you're doing sky especially because you don't want to have to go back in there and rework it after it's dry. You want to do this all in one layer if you can. Now I'm going to go away from the reference photo a little bit and I'm going to put, I'm putting the cyan kind of in its, on its own in some of these darker patches because I, I wanted to kick the color up a little bit. The reference photo is not, um, it's beautiful, it's pretty, but it's not exactly what I had in my mind's eye that I wanted to paint. So I'm going to use the reference for the information, which it's very good for. Here I'm gonna blot my brush off and watch this trick, this is really handy. I am going to, that's why I'm tipping it, so if I do get any puddles, they fall right along the edge of the mountain here. And then I dry my brush off, with a paper towel and I just go along the edge and I drink up any of that extra paint and that will keep me from getting any backgrounds. You can almost see a background starting to form there so you're going to soak up any any paint. So I'm going to clean my brush uh, and I'm still using that three quarter flat. Maybe it's a one inch flat. I think it says three quarter but it's I would call it an inch. It's pretty uh, pretty wide. I'm going to grab some of that mauve color that I was using And it's pretty, look at that, pretty thin. Can you see that on my palette? It's pretty thin. I'm going to scoop that up a little bit. There we go. I'm going to push my water containers out of the way. So you see that really thin. I'm going to add some of that in there too. Blot my brush a little bit. I had a little too much on there. Try not to introduce a lot of water. I mean, you got to thin your paint out, but if you blot your brush on your paper towel, you can remove a lot of that water. Or you can go in with a round brush if your flat is just holding way too much. And I'm kind of adding it right next to those uh, those blues. And again, you don't have to do this. I just felt like I wanted a little bit of color. Especially when I think of like Japanese scenes, like there's some Japanese, it looks like almost Japanese maples um, in the reference photo, but I think I'm gonna put cherry blossoms in actually, cause I, I don't know, I think that's so like, I don't know when I think of Japan, that's what I think of. All right, so I'm going to leave the white areas of the, of the mountain alone for now. What I'm going to do is start painting in the mountain area. Now, what I want to do down here is actually wet the paper a bit because I'm going to layer on the trees and I want to make sure that... Um, 
that whatever I'm doing in the mountain kind of fades off and then I can layer over it and it's not going to be really strong. So if I add water here at the bottom, that's going to help me achieve that. And I can actually even do that with a little bit of a mist from my spray bottle. You can find these at any, uh, any department store. It's just a little two ounce spray bottle. You could recycle a hairspray or a body spray bottle. Just clean it out good so it doesn't give you a headache if it's smelly. And now for that color, um, I definitely want to have some of the colors I already used, but I think I'm going to, I might even go with a little Payne's Gray. That's a color I rarely ever use. Um, it's just something I usually find doesn't add much, but sometimes it's a very interesting in a landscape because it's, it's a color that's made with other colors, so it's like a multi-pigment color. And sometimes the colors can separate and mix and give you some interesting effects. And I think for this, it's going to work really well. So let me just scoot this over. You can see me mixing. I should probably just turn it like this. You probably don't need to see the pan. Seeing the palette's a little bit better. Um, I am going to take the paint's gray. I might do this whole thing with this brush. I don't know. I a two day old teacup sitting on the side of my, <laughs> my thing. I'm so ready for vacation. I'm filming this uh, before I leave on vacation and you're watching it while I'm on vacation. Uh, a little bit of that mauve in there. I'm going to call it mauve because if you use uh, Windsor Newton, that's what they call this color, this a particular shade. And I just, I figured that's probably a little bit more of a common name than they're just, them just calling it purple here in the Lucas line. I find that whenever you have, uh, or a lot of times when you have paints that are made, um, usually the German paints have the, you know, if it's in Europe, they usually have very similar color naming systems, but sometimes you get some gorgeous paints that are made in Japan or Korea or China and they just use a weird naming system. So I'm gonna to have to be careful as I go near the sky just because I don't want to I don't want to have this run into the sky. But I can just pretend like there's a snow cap there, so I don't really have to bring that to the sky right now. And I'm going to start painting in my mountain, the rock, the rocky bits. Use the edge of your brush to get those little bitty bits of um, bare boulders. And kind of twist and turn your brush as you go. You're going to have the darker concentration up here where it's next to the white because they're going to have a little bit more contrast. I mean, it's pretty much the same value all the way through. However, we're doing that little trick where we um, where we're going to let it fade out onto the wet paper so that we can layer up because with watercolor being transparent you can't layer it up as well as you could if it, you had like say gouache or acrylics or oils or something so that's just a little trick that I do sometimes feel free to use that little trick you'll find it very handy I think and I just try to um, not make it look too uniform and then as you bring this down can let it fade into the wet area of the paper. Mm. I love to see paint doing its thing. I like to add my paint. I'm adding, going to add the paint up here in the darker areas and let it fade down. So if I was using a cotton watercolor paper, one of the big differences would be that I would have more time to work. When you're working on a cellulose paper, um, you are a little bit more limited. And that's probably why I don't mind using cellulose papers when I'm plein air painting or painting out in the world because I generally paint very quickly when I'm doing that. So I don't really notice, you know, those, you know, any problems with it, with the drying too soon. But um, if you're, if you feel like you're fighting your paper all the time, that could be why. I'm also up here, this is darker than the reference photo. I'm making the contrast a little bit more because that's what I want. You don't have to, though. Now, I don't know if it's dry enough. I'm just going to go in here. I want to add a little bit of rockiness up here at the opening. And I can go in with more later, but I like to do as much as I can um, in the first layer. I feel like it just keeps everything a little bit fresher. Now, as my paper starts dry, I have to be careful or I'm going to end up with some weird edges. Now, I think I'm going to help this edge here mist off, kind of turn into like a bit of a mist by just spraying it. 
Isn't that pretty? I just love how it, what it just does on its own. Ah, love it. I want to hit in that area too because I was feeling it starting to dry. I'm just being careful. I'm trying not to hit the snowy areas. Now if you have some rivulets there that aren't what you want, take your brush, clean it, blot it, and just kind of drag it across. And you will want to mop up any of the puddles at the bottom. If you want more color, now is the time to add it. If you feel like you can't get the color with a softer brush like those Mimic Squirrels, because they do act like a squirrel brush, what you can do is grab a golden Taclon brush, and this is what you would often use for acrylic painting. It's a little firmer. Um, or sometimes you're, if you have a synthetic brush with an aquarelle handle, you'll have these stiffer bristles. And you go in with a brush like this, and you can, and you can kind of cut in. Look how much darker my paint looks because the bristles are stiffer and will grab more paint from the, um, the pan. And also because I've been painting and now that pan of paint has been wet for a few minutes, it's already wants to it wants to release a little bit more pigment. So you can do that when you need, when you want a little bit darker. I don't know if I really, if that was a good choice. Let's get a little purple in there. Get some of those other colors in there, some of that purple and some of that cyan. These are all, all these colors obviously are in the 48 set of uh, Lucas. The Jerry's has been running a lot of specials this summer on watercolors, so um, it's definitely worth a look. I know they usually run really good prices on the Lucas, really good prices on their Turner paints as well, but they carry any, you know, pretty much any brand you can think of. So I definitely would, uh, would check them first you're price shopping around, they usually have the best price. You pretty much have the best price unless you're like an actual wholesale account and you're and you've got like some wholes wholesale connections. All right, now here's where I have to be careful on the the cellulose paper. If I mess around here too much, I'm going to start lifting the paper underneath and I'm going to start getting streaks. So, um, and that happens to a lot of beginners because of the paper they're using and they might be working a little slow. So I'm just going to give it a little spritz, help that paper paint run, see if there's anything else I want to add um, in this layer up here before I'm done. And then I got to leave it be, leave, leave it be, let it dry. trying to bring any lines to kind of come out from the center and go down just help form the mountain a little bit better all right now I've got a big puddle at the bottom if I leave that I'm gonna have a mess I'm gonna have a big cauliflower which isn't gonna really work with what I'm going for it might work like if I want to have a row of hedges or bushes at the bottom but that's not what I want so I'm just wiping off the bottom and absorbing all of that paint Okay, now my sky isn't quite dry. I think at this point I really need to let everything dry, so that's what we're going to do, and when we come back we're going to finish it up. Okay, this is dry. I actually set it outside in the sun, and that really helped it dry up real quick. I'm not really happy with what's going on up here, um, so I think I'm going to warm it up a little bit. I'm going to use, um, I think I'll grab a little bit of Naples Yellow, and I'm just going to look at my little chart here, because their Naples Yellow is... A lot stronger than um, than other companies Naples Yellow so I'm just gonna make sure I have water and work it out a little bit you know blot the belly of my brush a little bit and I'm gonna add a little bit of that in here just to warm it up a bit and then I'm gonna take I'm gonna clean my brush take a little bit of the um, the mauve that we were using because it's quite pink and I want to add some of that in there too. Maybe a little bit more. I like to stick to the colors that I've already used versus grabbing something new. But you know, if you had a you know a pink color that you preferred, you certainly could use that. Or you know, if you had a if you're gonna use a different pink in your cherry blossoms, you could use that. That's a little too bold. There, just blot that off a little bit. 
I could always add some white gouache in there if I want to or if I want more snow. Uh, but that's going to give me a pretty good, uh, pretty good area right there. I'm going to grab a smaller brush. And I'm going, going to add some of the darker area within the, um, let's grab this little mimic one here. And I'm just going to use the color already mixed up. I'm going to add that into the center of the mountain here. I wanted to do that a little bit in the first layer, but I knew that my sky was a little bit too wet still. And I was going to have an issue if I did that. And then I can just add a little bit of a broken line and um, kind of hint at the shape without outlining it. Just kind of a broken line is all I really need right there. Like that a little bit. That might be a bit much, but let's block that. That's a little too much. With the wet paint, it's just kind of fuzzing. Okay, I'm going to leave that be for now. I can always go back in and, and do some more. I'm going to grab my liner brush and I'm going to throw in some branches. And um, I think, let's see, what colors? I've got the panes gray. Let's see, what colors, what can I make for branches out of colors I already have? What colors I've already used? I'm going to add some of that Naples yellow to it and see what I get. And that was this guy right here. That's a beautiful Naples yellow. It's almost um, it's almost yellow ochre. Now the only downside to this is that you know you're gonna have to if you're mixing a color you're gonna have you either make a, as much as you're going to need, or you're gonna have to stop and remix. I'm actually gonna mix this with a bigger brush because I'll be here all day, and I'm sure you've got better things to do than watching me mix paint on a palette. Now purple and yellow, those colors tend to make a brown. Throw in that paint's gray, and then we've got kind of like a, just a grayed, very grayed, um, kind of plain brown. Now with the liner brush, you want to absorb as much as you can. The benefit of this brush is that you can make a lot of lines without reloading. So I'm just going to... Kind of put lines where I think I want to have leaves or blossoms. And um, I don't have to connect them. I just need to have um, just uh, almost like a skeleton. It's going to hold the leaves. I don't need to have a lot going on here. Oops, I got to. If you notice you've dropped water, try to blot it up as soon as you notice it. Now, actually, this paper that I'm using, it's inexpensive. Um, it's not the cheapest paper in the world, but it's definitely, definitely pretty affordable. It is the Strathmore 400 series. Um, you can find that at Jerry's. I like this because it does kind of behave a little bit more like a cotton paper than, say, the Strathmore 300 series. That said, it's not going to take the wear and tear that your typical cotton paper will take. So that just kind of keep that in mind. And I have had issues with it. Um, this pad has been great. I don't, it's pretty old and I ha don't have any uh, instances of the sizing going off, but sometimes with papers, like if you haven't stored them well, like maybe they've been floating around in the back of your kayak for a while or you've, you know, like I, t I tend to paint out and about a lot and then I'll have like a bag where I've got my gear and I might have like a wet towel or a beach blanket or something and I forget about the paper for a couple months, you know, then that's when your sizing starts to go bad. Or if you store your paper in a damp area, maybe you have it out in like um, your barn or in your basement and it's not an area that has a dehumidifier running or an area that you get to use very often, then what will happen is you'll go to paint, and this can sometimes happen on new paper, maybe the, the where you've bought it hasn't stored it properly, you'll see little speckles, and it will look kind of like somebody just speckled gray, like took gray paint on a toothbrush and speckled it. It'll look like that, and generally what that is is a sizing kind of going bad, like moisture has gotten into it, and um, and it, then it, it wants to take your paint unevenly. It's almost like it washes away the sizing, the humidity washes away the sizing, and then your your paint is just like clinging to the um, to the fibers of the paper unevenly, so you get little patches of darker speckles. So if you see that happen, if it's something that's new, like you just bought the paint the paper and it's doing that, just take it back. Um, you know you shouldn't have any problem taking that back to the store. 
it will really, you'll be glad you did. So I'm going to see, I might need to add another pink, but I'm really just going to start off with that mauve and you probably, I'm just going to scooch my palette over so you can see this. I'm taking a hog fan brush, just an old um, recycled brush from oil painting that I've cleaned really well. And I'm scrubbing that into my, uh, my paints. Now I want to let you know, Jerry's Arima now has a faux hog brush. Um, for many, many years, like I've had this brush for probably 25 years, um, for many, many years, it was just not really a good substitute for hog brush brushes. And the hog bristles do come as a byproduct. I mean, this is kind of like using the whole animal. They don't kill the, the hogs for the bristles. It's, they're killed for their meat. And then this is, would otherwise be gone to waste. So that's kind of how I, you know, justify using a hog brush, but I don't like to use a, um, a nap, like a squirrel brush because squirrels are killed for their fur. Anyway. <laughs> Um, you can now get a good synthetic hog brush if you're looking. It's called the Mimic Hog at Jerry's Autorama, but made by Creative Mark. Check that out. Um, but if you already have something, I suggest you use what you have. So I like to use a fan brush for spattering, a big old stiff fan brush, because I get really um, random specks, and I like that. Now, that was probably a little bit more than I needed, but I like to get that kind of like looseness to it. I feel like it gives it a good atmosphere. Now I'm going to go in with this guy. This is one of my favorite brushes. This is the number 30 round. It's in the value set um, of the Mimic brushes, of the Mimic squirrel brushes, which are a faux squirrel. Um, and just to get a brush this big, that this high quality that is that comes to a really nice point is so excellent. I'm actually going to mix that up with this little synthetic though because it's just easier to get the paint out with a stiffer brush. But it's great for spattering, especially if you like to spatter water on first and then paint and then get that really nice loose look. But it also holds a really nice point and it's just a really nice all around brush. It's good for skies, especially if you have stormy clouds because it, it almost acts like a mop, but it's a little bit more controlled than a mop. It's just a nice brush. All right, I'm gonna sop up what I can there and I am going to Gonna need a little bit more water in there. I want to get some bigger splots. And we can also go, this is something else I like to do, um, is I will go in and flick on clear water. And I'll end up with these nice round speckles that I can't seem to get really good and round when I do it with paint for whatever reason. I don't know if I'm just, maybe because the paint makes it too thick or maybe I'm just not brave enough, but I get much better little round speckles for flowers when I do this. So I go in with water and then I'll go in with a brush loaded with paint and I'll drop the paint into the speckles and I'll show you here. I'll just kind of drop it in there and then I'll get more of a, I'll get the, the, the flowers exactly where I want them because I'm dropping them into the paint drops, but yet it still looks spattered on, which is the look that I'm, that I'm going for, for this layer. Now in the springtime in Maine, I think we actually have a fairly similar climate to Japan in Maine. Um, I've been told that anyways. I know they bring a lot of plants, uh, a lot of the plants that we have and trees we can get. Um, we've had some that comes from the, the same climate as Japan because we have a similar, similar um, seasons. Ours, I think our winters are more harsh, but, um, but we have these beautiful flowering trees, cherry trees and um, apple trees in the spring and they have this those are very similar blooms so I'm kind of going from my experience painting those since I haven't been to Japan and I think it, it can be very difficult to paint a place that you've never been to so you kind of do have to pull from what you know I want to bring these off to the edge and I want them a little bit bigger as they get off to the edge and they're just blots Now I'm going to try splattering with this one. This is not a very um, absorbent brush. This is a, um, a little bit firmer of a brush. But it was handy and it was just what I wanted. And I might mix in some more of a magenta color that's a little bit less blue. Where this purple, this mauve has quite a bit of uh, blue undertone to it. 
but I figured I would definitely like to get the the um, the majority of the colors done with colors I've already used. Uh, I definitely like to go in first that way. So I don't want to have like these divided into different sections because right now I have section of flower here over the mountain, section of flower here over the sky. I want to combine those so I have a unity, more of a unity in my picture. I'm going to do the water trick there again. Now Lucas Paints, I think that they don't have ox gall in them. And I think that's why you don't get as much of a flow. Remember when I said like I like to use Lucas Paints when I'm doing something a little more delicate? Um, they don't have quite the flow. That and I had a pan. I, I purchased a pan of, I don't know if they sell a, if it's a real ox gall or a imitation a synthetic ox gall, but um, they do sell pans of ox gall if you want to have more flow. And I don't know what I did with mine, actually. I think I probably stuck it in my little... Uh, my little drawer with my mediums in it. Uh, but anyway, so you don't get as much flow with the Lucas paints, I will tell you that, in case that's something you're really important and really important to you. I prefer the core paints when I want something with a lot of flow. I do think I want some more, like more um, warm pink in there, so I'm going to flick on some of this, which is Genuine Rose. It's called Genuine Rose. It's the same, it's actually the same pigment number as this. Both They both use PV19. But the way it's produced, it gives this paint more of a pink. It's the same exact single pigment color, single pigment pigment, but depending on how, how fine they're milled, um, other different variables like that, I'm not a chemist, they'll, they'll have different properties. That's why you can have like four browns in your palette and they're all PBR7 and they all look a little different. They'll be warmer and cooler and ashier and richer uh, just because there's so many different ways they can, they can grind up a pigment and heat it and treat it and get all these lovely little uh, effects. So there's no cherry blossoms in my reference photo. <laughs> I'm not looking at a reference photo for these. I'm just kind of dabbing, obviously. So, But you could definitely find plenty of reference photos for cherry blossoms if you want to. Now, something else I think that would be kind of cool is to add some yellow, is to take some of this Naples yellow that we used because it's a pretty clean yellow, honestly. It's not muddy. Some Naples yellows tend to be a little bit more, more muddy. And I just want little flicks of them, like maybe to represent the centers of the flower. So I'm just flicking a little bit of that on there, especially towards the top of the sky, because I like to have light, bright yellows high. Uh, I like to have darker, cooler colors low, because I feel like it gives you a better weight. I'm flicking a little bit down here, but I'm not going to do a lot. I like that. I really don't feel like I want to do much more to that and I'll leave that be, especially as it dries and it starts to reveal its true color. Now over here, I'm going to have a little bit more form. I want to grab, um, let's see, I think I'm going to use some sap green. Um, let's see, I have that, the, I think I'm going to snuck an extra paint. No, let's stay with that for sap green. There's that Lucas sap green is very vivid. I'm going to tone that down with a little bit of Payne's gray. It's so funny. Um, different companies use different recipes for their for their sap green, especially, and you'll find your favorites. And you'll find you like in some brands you like their olive green better than their sap green. And I'm gonna turn this right around so I'm comfortable, and I'm just gonna just do some little, just little. Okay, you know what? I'm gonna lift this up closer to the camera. I'm going to show you exactly what my brush is doing because I think that could be a little confusing. I've got a little, a little like number six pointed round here. Use whatever size you like. And I'm just going to press and lift. See, it's not anything really um, specific. I'm just pressing and lifting. There's nothing fancy here. The reason I'm doing this color here, this is going to be my darkest value in these trees. I want to get that in first. Press and lift, press and lift. Twist your brush. Try not to make all the shapes the same. And I do want some air to show. Okay, so I've got a bunch of those darker shades. Pull a couple down over the mountain so we don't have, so we have unity. I got a little, uh, I've got some pink running there, so I'm just going to blot that up. I don't want to have a streak of like there was some cherry blossoms flying on by. I don't want that, so I'm going to blot those off. Gosh, this is going to be another one of those long tutorials, guys. Sorry. 
But you know, I'm on vacation this week, so I'm probably not going to post as much. So you know, you can you can divide it up over the week. I'm gonna take some of this Naples yellow. I'm gonna grab some of the sap green there. This gives you a kind of a khaki green color, especially if it has a little of that paint's gray in there. And I'm going to do some little flicks of that. So we have the light dancing in these blossoms. This is definitely an impressionistic style. It's easy. We can all do it. Tell your friends. Tell your friends that have looked at your paintings and said, Oh, I wish I could paint, but I can't draw a straight line. We'll say, Honey, there ain't no straight lines there. Here's a brush. Here's a piece of paper. Give this a try. It's so fun to, uh, to see a beginner start painting because, you know, especially something like this, it's fun. It's relaxing. You know, you don't need expensive supplies for this. You know, you could use whatever watercolors you have on hand. The nice thing about the Lucas is that they are affordable and, you know, they'll grow with you. But if all you have is, you know, your kids' watercolors, give it a try. It's not going to hurt anything. I would recommend having a watercolor paper versus just like, you know, printer paper or something because that's really tough. That's, you're really, you're really going to make it hard on yourself doing that. But, um, but you know, if you have a, you know, a, a decent branded watercolor paper and you have some paints, I would also, you know, recommend getting a decent brush just because, again, it's going to grow with you and you're always going to have them if you take care of them. Just add some sap green on its own just to kind of give you a little bit warmer color. And I think I'll just maybe some Payne's Green. Payne's Green. Payne's Green, that's what we call this when you mix our sap green and Payne's Gray. We've got Payne's Green. A Payne's Gray on its own just a little bit of... A little bit of that uh, the color in there just to kind of add some little shadowed areas. It just says, oh, it's probably a thicker bit of branches there. If you have like a patch where you've got, oh no, I had a splash of water, now I've got this big green monster there, you go ahead and just add some little specks of Payne's Gray on top and it just gives it, it aerates it a little bit. That's not really an art term, but you know what I mean, aerates it. Like you aerate your water, you add some bubbles, that's what you're doing. You're adding some air in there, you're aerating it. You're airing out the tree. Okay, that's not too shabby. Alright, I feel like I wanted a few more branches over there, and I'm gonna do, I mean, you know what, I'm just gonna do those in Payne's Gray, why not? Let's just grab that Payne's Gray. This is a lovely Payne's Gray, by the way. I, but I am mixing it in that other brown, the brown that I made. I am mixing that paint's gray out there because I might as well have that cross-pollination of color. And if you've got some, like, leaves just kind of hanging out, doing their thing, and they don't have, seem to have a branch, and it looks weird, or you just don't like it like that, or you feel like you want some linear, uh, like, movement, you want to guide the eye through, that's a great use for the branch. I love pictures like this because it's kind of like you're in a little secret nook and I love little nooks and little spaces like that and you're in this little nook and you might be having a picnic and you found the perfect secret spot you know you're visiting you're visiting Japan and you found a secret little spot where you could have a picnic and you have the most beautiful view and there's nobody around you're just kind of peeking through these trees that are in bloom and it's gorgeous and that's what this painting, that's what this painting is about. I, that's what I think this painting really is about. Okay, I want to grab that same round brush I was doing these leaves with. And I'm going to grab some green and throw a few leaves over here. Now, the benefit of a paint that doesn't have a lot of flow is that um, the paint will generally stay where you put it. And so much of this is personal preference. Like, if you enjoy Holbein paint, you're probably going to enjoy the Lucas paint. If you do not like Holbein paint and you've used it, you're probably not going to love the Lucas paint. Everybody has their own... Um, I generally like a paint with more flow, but then sometimes I want something that's just got that little bit more of a, a subtlety. The other thing I like about the paint with less flow, a paint with less flow tends to work better on cheaper paper. So that's something to keep in mind. So if you're like, if you wanted to use rice paper, if you wanted to use something else that wasn't size, like you maybe you're you deal with a bunch of different crafts and you know that you're going to want to work on 
rice paper or scrapbook paper like cardstock and you know you just want to be able to add a little bit of you know here and there a paper that a paint that is less fluid is going to work a little bit better it's you know without the ox gall it's not going to you know disrupt the, it's not going to increase the um, or decrease the surface tension in the water and make it go everywhere it's going to behave for you a little bit more now if you want to stop now, that's totally fine. I'm going to go a step further and then you can decide if it's for you or not. There is white watercolor paint. I'm going to show you the difference between white watercolor paint and white gouache while we're at it. So white watercolor paint, I'm just going to give us a little quick spritz on my palette. You can see you got that little, that little chick little white paint. You always get these little, I'm not a big fan of white watercolor paint, but in a lot of sets you get this little chick little white paint and it's usually, it's usually not that potent. Um, over here I've got some white gouache, which I actually just squirted out in a tackle box and I let it dry. The Lucas Studio gouache is fantastic, very affordable if you're looking for something like that. I'm going to give this a little spritz too. Now gouache is opaque. So you might think, well, what's the difference? White and watercolor, white and gouache. White watercolor is going to be more translucent because when you're working with watercolor, a lot of times, you know, you want to keep that light translucency. And the white watercolor really isn't meant to you be used to cover up anything. It's more to mix in something and temper your paints to make them either granulate a little bit or make it so you don't have to add tons and tons of water and you can not have it like slopping all over the place. Like you want to have it lighter, but you don't want to have it flow. And it's kind of more of a high level watercolor painting technique. It's not something you'd probably use in your day to day, in your day to day painting. There's definitely, um, I don't want to say right ways and wrong ways to use white watercolor, but there's definitely more effective ways to use it. So say I'm taking this white watercolor here, and I'm just going to, this, and this is pretty decent. I mean, it's still, it's pretty opaque. You can see it on my bristles and everything. If I go and I say I want to cover this up, actually, boy, this actually is covering up pretty well. I may have to eat my words here. Um, but generally, let's bring some down to the mountain. Generally, white watercolor is going to be translucent when it dries. And it doesn't appear, I obviously haven't used much of the white in the Lucas line, but this actually this doesn't appear to be very, very, uh, very translucent. Um, but it's generally meant for like tempering your colors or adding a texture or granulation to your colors. It's generally not used as like something to cover up something. And, at fr and, and beginners get very frustrated because maybe they've come from painting with acrylics or oils or they painted with tempera. Um, or something in their childhood and they're frustrated because this white watercolor is not behaving the way they believe it should But generally your white watercolor is meant for mixing and actually that worked out pretty well that that did mask pretty well um, So I'm not probably not going to get as different as diverse a contrast between the white watercolor and the white gouache white gouache comes in a tube and you can squirt out a little dollop of it fresh as needed or you can um or you can let it dry in a container. Just make sure your the walls in the container are high like these are. Otherwise, they can crack and fall apart. You can see how they kind of look like little boulders in there. If they crack and fall apart and get all mixed up, you're going to have to toss it because that would be so tedious to try to pull apart all those little chunks of uh, paint. Okay, now you can see here, look in the middle there where I put that white, that white watercolor. You can see as it's drying, it's already becoming more translucent and you can see that gray underneath. I'm going to bring it up a little bit more to make sure you can really see it. Okay, you can see that gray underneath. It's not fully dry. And here, where I did put it in the amount, it looked opaque when it went on, but now it's drying and it is getting more translucent. I'm going to blast it real quick with the heat and you can see exactly what I mean. That's probably good enough. I just need a little bit there. Um, so it's a little bit more translucent. Definitely not as white as the white of the paper. But your gouache, your white gouache, will be as white of the, as the, the white of the paper. Actually, I'm, you know what, I'm going to grab a different brush because I think I want a similar to the brush that I used to paint, to paint the, um, the mountain. This is good. I'm getting way more in depth with this than I intended to. Uh, but if you like this sort of thing, if you like this in depth uh, tutorial, check out my, my watercolor landscape workshop class because I do kind of go down the weeds with a lot of this stuff and um, you might find it really, I hope you find it really useful. So if I go over that with the, with the gouache, the gouache is going to be much more opaque. It'll be the most opaque right from the tube, but I like the convenience of using it 
from the uh, from the dry pan that way I don't have to squirt anything out. Any texture and detail I kind of want to keep towards the, the top of the mountain. And I'm just going to keep pulling down. So this is like a positive style painting, meaning I'm layering up, I'm painting the snow. Before when we did the mountain we were doing a negative style painting, we're painting around the snow. And this can make things look a little fussy, but it can also bring back a white or it can give a dominance to an area that had um, kind of been left. Now the temptation might be to use gouache really thickly and you don't want to do that because paper flexes and it could actually crack and pop off the, the paper just like it cracks in my palette here. So don't use it too thick. You want it like a thin, like um, the consistency of like half and half or something. You don't want to go too thick with that. Um, and Okay, I'm going to keep using this uh, round brush here. And I'm going to go um, just dab it into some of the wet paint in the cherry blossoms. And now you could do that, definitely do that with the, um, oh, can you see that? There we go. Uh, you could definitely do that with the white watercolor. I think for that, that would work just fine. I think I will add some more magenta blooms and then drip it into the magenta. I think that would look really nice. That's a fun thing about painting in an expressive way versus like really being a slave to the reference photo is that, you know, you stop looking at a reference and then once you've got the bones down, you start being a little more expressive and you give yourself the permission to play. And that can be really hard, um, especially when you, you know, you're worried about how it's going to come out and you don't want to waste your paper um, or you just don't feel confident enough because you haven't been painting long enough but once you give yourself that permission just to play it's it's so much more fun and some things are going to be a hot mess and some things just aren't going to work you know and you've got to embrace that you know and if and that's why I love the cheap paper because if you are you know if you're letting a fear of wasting supplies keep you from painting then using some cheap paper it's going to help take away that fear. All right, so now I'm going to grab some more white. And actually, it might be kind of fun to actually flip the white on over where I just flicked the, uh, oh, I like that, right over where I just flicked the, um, the paint, the pink paint, and it gives me a little bit of a sparkle. It's, I think, really pretty. Now you do need to water it quite a bit to be able to get it to flicking consistency and that's going to make it more translucent when it dries because you've thinned it down, but it's still a really pretty effect. You will need to wash your table when you're done. I should, probably should have mentioned that before we got too involved that yeah, this is going to make a mess on your table. I try not to flick my camera. Sometimes I end up flicking my camera. Hopefully I don't have any spots on my camera. And that always scares me a little bit because I recently upgraded to a good, a really nice camera. Uh, I should probably uh, use my cheaper camera when I'm doing this technique, but I never know exactly when I'm going to want to do it because it's it sneaks in pretty much every painting. I feel like I'm, I'm sneaking in some spatters. Okay, at this point, I think I am going to let it dry and then see what final details I want to add. So I will see you back in a minute. I have to say I'm really liking the way this is coming out. Um, I started to play a little bit by adding some of the yellow and mauve into the into the snow and I liked it so I'm just gonna grab a little bit of that cyan color and add some of that in there too. Now of course this is mixing in with that gouache and the white watercolor that we put in there but um, I think it's kind of nice. It just kind of like tempers it a little bit and just gives it a little bit, I don't know, a little more unity with the rest of the picture. I think it just kind of faded off and nothing there. Okay, I want to do a few branches over here, but I really don't want to mess with it too much because even though it's pretty loose and impressionistic, I really like it. Um, I'll write down the colors I used in the video description so you can 
I'll check it out if you want to. Just make our muddy branch color here. Dark and muddy. Not really uh, brown, not really prominent. Need to mix a little more color, so I'm going to go to one of my stiffer synthetics here and save the wear and tear on my liner. I don't know why I always go in for my darkest color first. I should go for the lightest color first because that's going to be the one that's going to be the, the weakest. We'll add a little bit of mauve into there or purple. Actually, maybe I'll use this for some of the thicker branches. I like the silhouettes. I think that can be a really strong device to use in a painting. When you have, um, uh, when you have like something you're looking between, it's kind of like also, I had to take a video production class in college, and um, even though I was a radio student actually, I ended up working in video here on YouTube. Um, but we had to take this class and one of the things that we would use would be called a gobo and it stood for go between and so you would film kind of like peeking through branches or lattice or something and it just would give you the sense of like intimacy or suspense or depth. Uh, you'd see it a lot also in animation like um, well, especially Disney animation they would use that device to create moving scenes that didn't require a lot of in a lot of illustration so they would have like a a, a transparency of, of uh, tree branches or tree trunks rather they would shift and like bushes they would shift the other way and by seeing those transparent layers shift it would give you the impression of of um, like somebody walking through the woods so it's just a really um, useful kind of, um, I'd call it technique, but a useful device in landscape painting, especially when you're trying to convey interest and depth and a sense of being there, when you can put the the um, the viewer right behind a little bit of a, of a, um, of a barrier. And it also makes a frame, which is another um, element of design that is really handy. So you make a, a nice little frame here. We have a little bear tree. I felt like that looked a little too naked there in the corner. So I'm putting just some some bear branches. We don't know what happened to that tree. Maybe some animal came and ate all the leaves off. I don't know. Oh, that's pretty. So if you wanted to go in and add a few details, I wouldn't go too detailed, but if you want to add a few details on some of these flowers, um, I would actually mix both of the pinks together. I would take your, I think that was, that was, um, oh shoot, I forgot what we called it. I dropped my swatch on the floor. I'll write it in the video description. Uh, <laughs> it's like a permanent rose. It's like the same, it's the same pigment as this, but just treated differently. You know, if you want to just kind of give the impression of a few individual blooms that are close, like kind of the bigger ones, just by putting maybe a few dabs. I really, really wouldn't go too, too detailed because if you start really detailing something, you're going to have to do it everywhere and then otherwise it's not going to look finished. So I would only do like kind of close to the bottom and loose, loose dabs just to kind of give you, okay, there's some individual petals there. They're not just clusters of flowers, you have some individual petals. Because when you have cherry blossoms or apple blossoms or something like that, you're usually seeing a branch that's just covered with tons and tons of little blooms. You're not seeing any of the individuals. You're seeing like masses of blooms, kind of like with lilacs. Um, and I do have a flower painting course too if you want more information on flower painting. But here you just want to kind of suggest and you know, I have to say, I really like that. Now, if you're thinking that maybe you lost a little too much in the mountain, you could take your Payne's Gray. Actually, probably just do the Payne's Gray on its own. Um, if you want to go in and add any little shadows, like maybe there's underneath where the snow is hanging up, you can do that. I would probably keep it towards the top because you want it to kind of fade away. Because see how we faded that mountain, now we can see all this other stuff, all these 
these it doesn't it doesn't feel like um like there's there's a little distance there it doesn't feel like there's a big mountain underneath these flowers it seems like we can see the flowers just fine i hope that makes sense i don't know if i described that very well i wish i didn't go that high with that brush but i just did so that's one of the reasons i use a small brush towards the end because especially if i'm gonna go in and mess around with something that I've already painted, by using a small brush is only, I can only do so much damage. So I, I, you know, put my brush down wrong or not exactly the way I want it, or I regret what I've been doing. I've only affected a small area, you know, versus going in with that big brush again, I could really wipe something out big time and regret it. Okay, we're just gonna finish up here. I do feel like I want a little bit more contrast on some of these branches. Um, sometimes I'll, I'll stop and, uh, like, hey, when the phone rings, right, you get, you get distracted. I'm sure we all, you know, we could spend, very few of us can spend hours and hours on end painting in one straight go, so we get distracted. But those distractions and those interruptions can actually be a very useful tool because then you get to give your eyes a break. Whereas you might be having so much fun, you don't want to take a break, you just want to paint, paint, paint until you're done which I get that because I love to do that when I get that when I get the chance um, but then you cut sometimes you come back things have had a chance to dry and you're like oh that really should be a little bit darker and then you can come back in and make it a little bit darker which is which is really nice and don't ever think your painting has to be done after one session you could finish it set it on your easel set it on a on your mantle or on a shelf wherever you could lean set it on your chair usually something on my my chair my office chair and then when I come in the next day I see it and I see the things that I wish that I had done and then I can I can change them. I can uh, add something. Maybe I want to add some gold leaf to something or maybe I want to go, um, you know, with a little bit darker of a color. Maybe I want to add a little colored pencil or I want to um, add some other mixed media or put some collage in there. And you get that benefit by giving it a little bit of, of time. So don't feel like you have to, you know, rush it. Don't feel like you have to... Um, finish it in one go. Now something I think might be actually really useful is take this Naples yellow um, and that's a Naples yellow is a color that tends to be a little opaque. Mix it in with some white on your palette. Ooh, that brush has got, that brush is going to need an actual washing. I usually just rinse my brushes out, my watercolor brushes out, but sometimes if you're using a really staining color um, like Payne's Gray, you will need to do an actual wash. I thought it might be nice on some of these uh, closer petals to do some little dabbing. That's too light, need more yellow. Um, like when we flicked on the yellow, I, I really like that effect. They can actually go in and, and when you look and you see that you've got some, you know, some really pretty areas and you want to draw a little attention, do some little yellow dots. And it can bring the eye in and turn those blobs into a little bit more orderly flowers. And the other thing I like about waiting and not finishing it all at once, as I finish this all at once, is that, uh, is that you get to, um, you know, you don't overwork it. Because that's probably what, it's better to have a painting a little underdone than overdone. It's just like a cookie. You know, your cookies taste better if they're, will taste much better. Oops, that's way big of a blob, but that's all right. Um, if you have, you know, it's better to cook a cookie a minute too short than cook it a minute too long, you know, because it, you know, it gets overworked. It's overbaked. Your paintings can get overbaked really easily. And then maybe flick a little bit of that on there too for a little bit of random. It's so fun. I mean, seriously, I was surprised at how much, how much fun this little painting was. I spent a lot more time on it than I intended to. But that means I was enjoying it, you know? You can always watch my videos on double speed if you want to. I don't mind. It's totally fine. And I'll just see if I want to brighten up any of these little leaves over here. You can encroach on your mountain as much as you want. You can overlap them out in a little bit. But if you're going to do that, you might want to actually wait a day or so because 
I'm kind of thinking, oh, I'm getting a little, getting awful brave for almost being done this painting, you know. I wanted to put a real brave branch in there. And uh, I think it'll be all right, actually. I would probably suggest to a student that they sleep on it, you know, let it sit a bit, look at it. I'm going to go into my bigger, my bigger brush though for those leaves. The sap green is very translucent, so I might add a little Naples yellow to that. Some dark ones in there first since my brush is already loaded. And if you get any sediment on your pans, just go over them with a uh, clean brush when you're done and it will go away. And if you've mixed a new color, just dab it in a few other places so it will so it'll match. All right, I'm gonna call this done as tempting as it is to work on it some more. And I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. Please give me a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. And if you would like some more landscape watercolor tutorials, check out my landscape watercolor workshop. It is 50% off for the month of July. It's my launch month special because I always want my, um, my viewers, my friends, my subscribers to have the best deal and it will not go cheaper than that. So um, if you want it, then grab it now until the end of the month. It, uh, use a coupon code LANDSCAPE50OFF. All that info is in the video description down below, so check it out if you want that. Thanks for watching. Until next time, happy crafting.